Welcome to Hotera's Presents, a brand agnostic interview podcast that seeks to objectively highlight the happenings within the world of diagnostics. And now, your hosts, Rich Thayer and Mickey Yade. Hello, and welcome to Hal Terrace Presents. My name is Rich Thayer, Managing Partner at Hal Terrace. And this is Mickey Yarday, Founding Partner at Hal Terrace. Today, we are joined by Dr. Rick Nolte with Carius DX. We had a fascinating conversation with Rick. Rick is very knowledgeable in the metagenomic space, and we talked quite a bit about that. And I think one of the takeaways is there's still a lot to be done, but uh, the proof points are difficult. In fact, it reminds me of Carl Sagan, who said, Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and they are building it, but there's a lot more to do. And now, our interview with Rick Nolte. Hello, Rick. Good morning, and welcome to our podcast of Health Harris Presents. Please tell our audience a bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Rich. It's uh, great to be here, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this podcast. A little bit about myself. I've spent uh, oh, a 40, I had a 40 plus year career in academic pathology and laboratory medicine. My primary focus has been in clinical and medical microbiology. I'm a medical microbiologist by training. Spent time at three different academic institutions. I uh, started out at the University of Rochester, then Emory University, and finished up my academic career at the Medical University of South Carolina. And when I finished there, I was vice chair of pathology and laboratory medicine and director of clinical labs. But throughout that career, my major research and clinical interest has been what I've been calling molecular microbiology. So, you know, leveraging the advances in molecular diagnostics to improve infectious disease uh, diagnosis. I made a recent career shift about two years ago when I retired from MUSC. I joined uh, Carius, the microbial cell-free DNA sequencing company. And why why do that uh, is my next career step. Well, it's a it's kind of a long story. I've had an I haven't had an eye on uh, metagenomics for infectious diseases for probably about a decade, and. Uh, when I was at MUSC, I, I, I taught medical students uh, a good bit and uh, gave a couple of lectures about the applications of metagenomics and the microbiome and health and, and human disease. So that kept me current with some of the, the recent advances. And to be honest with you, as a practitioner, right, I was debating, uh, is, is metagenomics, microbiome analysis, Is it a discovery tool or is it a diagnostic tool? And come to the conclusion with the recent advantages that I think it has tremendous value as both. Um, But I think our focus today is going to be on on metagenomics for infectious disease diagnostics. And why Carius? The group there, Tim Blaukamp, who's the chief scientific officer and the rest of the group, published a landmark paper in 2019, which was the first thorough peer-reviewed clinical and analytical validation of a metagenomic test for infectious disease diagnostics. I read that paper and was really quite impressed with the level of uh, detail and the science behind it. I struck up a relationship with uh, Tim professional meetings. We kept in contact. This was around 2019. And uh, when I left MUSC in the summer of uh, 2021, they were, Carius was um, kind enough to let me join the team as a senior uh, director of our medical affairs team. Well, thank you, Rick. Uh, You certainly had a fascinating career. It occurs to me that there may be some parallels with where biotech was in the early days, you know, with advancements in cloning and sequencing that led basically to the foundation of a whole brand new industry and where we might be today with um, the, uh, the space, the application of metagenomics. Do you see any parallels there? Yeah, I do, Rich. That's a great question. The, the, you know, I've been lucky enough during my career to be in a position to be involved with a number of, of companies and, and organizations that have been advancing uh, molecular diagnostics from, you know, 
from PCR to branch DNA to all of the, the explosion of different target and signal amplification methods. And then uh, with the emergence of uh, syndromic panels for infectious disease diagnostics, yeah, I was, I was actually at the table uh, early on with Idaho uh, Technologies that then morphed into uh, BioFire and now BioMariU. And so th- watching what's happened over the years and the, um, some of the challenges in terms of dealing with the new technology and its application in the clinical lab has been sort of, I think, sort of my sweet spot in my career. And the level of complexity and the breadth of coverage that metagenomics offers is both a, a, a blessing and a curse. Um, there is, I'm, I, I still feel there are considerable knowledge gaps among the diagnostic and the medical community about what the true potential is for these types of tests. And I really appreciate having the opportunity to try to help fill those gaps in knowledge and uh, truly find out where metagenomic testing for infectious disease, where it's going to wind up. Is a, I, I, think, I think we already have um, significant evidence that it is a, a very useful adjunct to uh, conventional microbiological methods. And in that conventional, we include some of the more recent developments in terms of syndromic panels and other molecular tests. But yeah, we clearly, um, there is a significant advantage offered there in terms of increased diagnostic yield. So, yeah, that's fascinating. We certainly agree with you. And in fact, over the years, we've had many very productive discussions with you concerning what manufacturers have done well and not so well to provide the right types of tests and instruments for laboratories. What are some of your key learnings and what would you advise our audience about developing tests for reference laboratory use? Yeah, well, in this space, it, it's, it's in the metagenomics space, as you're well aware, the only tests that are available are laboratory developed tests. Um, there's really no real distributed model for testing. So there are a limited number of players, right? There are major academic institutions, to name a few, um, University of California, San Francisco, uh, University of Washington, Johns Hopkins, and others I'm sure I've, I'm neglected to remember. But there are a few academic practitioners that have launched, you know, metagenomic platforms for ID diagnostics. Uh, There are a number of companies uh, now in the space. Our company is a little unique in that in the analyte, uh, we are sequencing microbial cell-free DNA. Most of the other uh, players in this field are are doing site-specific analysis, if you will. if a patient suspected of having a CNS infection, you get some cerebral spinal fluid and do the metagenomic analysis. Uh, if they have a brain abscess, you need abscess material. In our tests, we can find uh, microbial signatures for infections throughout the body in the plasma. So that's a little different take on it. But uh, your question in terms of what, you know, the instrumentation most people are employing Illumina platforms for the sequencing, uh, but these are laboratory developed tests. So all of the other components um, are differ between laboratories. So I, I like to, there, there's something I think that's important in terms of, since many of the tests that laboratories are using are not local, they're referral laboratory tests. Because frankly, most um, clinical laboratories can't afford the substantial investment that would go into develop, developing their own solutions. So as I said, those limited number of academic laboratories, the commercial companies that are out there are providing most of the, most of the testing. There are a couple of things that I think are important that all laboratories need to consider whether they're going to develop their own metagenomic test or, you know, use a referral laboratory to provide that service. Um, and they're kind of, kind of simple. It's like who, what, where, when, and why. The who is, yeah, what 
patient uh, selection factors for use case scenarios. So which patients would actually benefit from metagenomic analysis? The what? Well, which methods, you know, which methods should you consider? Uh, as I mentioned, site-specific, so for plasma in our case. And, you know, which method is appropriate for which population? And then the where we've already touched on. Is it going to be a local offering? Or is it going to be employing a referral lab? When? This is a really key point, I think, for the for where we get with metagenomic analysis. Because of its, its breadth and uh, depth of coverage, when should the sample be collected in the patient's diagnostic journey, right? In order to, to maximize the potential clinical impact, I feel that the, these tests ought to be done earlier rather than later in the, in the patient diagnostic journey. We know that <clears throat> we know from experience that often these tests are deployed as a Hail Mary pass. So you've come to the end of a long diagnostic journey using standard of care tests. And then people throw their hands up in the air and say, okay, let's try a metagenomic test. By the time you get to the end of that journey, uh, you've lost much of the opportunity to have a clinical impact. So I, there is, you know, I think a growing recognition that with um, this technology, it might have its best opportunity at demonstrating that clinical impact if done early in the hospital course. And then uh, finally, you know, why? Why do you want to uh, implement a test like this or use a test like this? Well, you've really got to look at the institutional goals, the you know, hospital lab or the clinic setting. And, you know, what do you, what do you want to accomplish? And that usually kind of has to balance the need for speed, comprehensiveness of the diagnostic, and cost effectiveness, right? And most importantly, I think, and I think what's, what's largely lacking in this space is developing clear diagnostic algorithms for its use, building the evidence to help define what the best use case scenarios are. And that, that leads into a, another discussion um, about diagnostic stewardship. These tests are, are among the most expensive in the infectious disease diagnostic space. But when used uh, in specific target patient populations, you can demonstrate clinical impact. You can demonstrate um, increased diagnostic yield over standard of care. But these aren't tests for every patient, right? So developing those those use case scenarios like febrile neutropenia, culture negative endocarditis, pneumonia in immunocompromised patients, fever of unknown origin. Those are the types of patients that we think this type of analysis will have the, the greatest clinical impact. Why don't we go backward to okay. <laughs> define what the heck metagenomics is? Yeah. So the term metagenomics has been with us for over 25 years, but the applications have morphed dramatically over that time, especially as it pertains to what you're involved with, which is infectious diseases. Can you please tell our listeners what metagenomics means today, how it's being used to understand microbe communities in human disease, and why that's important? Yeah. You know, metagenomics, in my way of thinking, is the comprehensive analysis of microbial and host genetic material that is in a patient sample. And while most methods that are used in this space are truly metagenomics, right? A complete analysis, a comprehensive analysis. We've also got this other term that's, that's popped up recently called targeted metagenomics, where there's a upfront decision about what is being sought, right? And instead of doing the complete analysis, it's a limited analysis. And that analysis is limited to 
a certain number of pathogens or group of pathogens. And that that term has sprung up recently, and they're, it's kind of an oxymoron, right? Targeted metagenomics doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense, but it's it it is a reality. I mean, it's a it you know it's a something more. It's something beyond a um, a syndromic panel, but it falls short of the complete analysis of everything that might be in the sample, both microbial and human. Right. Right. I'm just wondering maybe some of the issues concerning um, different types of information the physician will get, uh, you know, traditional ways of, of determining what the pathogen is mm-hmm. versus metagenomics, which often reveals organisms present they are surprised to see. And, and, and how, how you work through that process of convincing them that the new information is more valuable than the old information. Yeah, that is that that is a tough question. Um, the uh, that that's tied up in a, in a number of other um, questions, I think here. So, you know, the basic question is that you know, diagnostically, it's you know been one test, one pathogen, or you know, if you go to syndromic panels, you may get one test, twenty five pathogens. Now, in our case, we have one test, fifteen hundred different potential pathogens in our clinically reportable range, right? And you're right. Oftentimes, um, we turn up findings that may not have been expected. Either these are um, significant findings, you know, and we, we do we do really well with a lot of the uh, rickettsial and, and Bartonella, zoonotic diseases. And, you know, when you're working through a patient like that with fever of unknown origin, they may not have suspected you know, the, the differential diagnosis is broad in those cases, but we may turn up something, you know, we may turn up Legionella and they weren't suspecting Legionella. And that one's pretty easy because that's an obligate pathogen. But there are also a lot of incidental findings that, you know, may or may not be clinically significant. I use this example a lot because strep mitis, right? It's a part of your normal upper airway flora. And many people have, have criticized uh, metagenomic analysis because you're, you're surfacing organisms like that. Well, that's a commensal, right? Well, yeah, it's a commensal in most people, but it's a major cause of sepsis in bone marrow transplant recipients early in their course of disease. And it's clearly a predominant cause of endocarditis. So that's the challenge, right? When you have a broad array of pathogens that you can detect, and we do um, make an attempt to not report everything we see. Uh, we have a 30,000 genome database of which we have curated 1,500 of them to put on our clinically reportable range of organisms. So that's still a lot of, a lot of organisms, but we don't report everything we detect. So that helps us. And should help others better help the physician understand the meaning of the report. Does that get to your question at all, Mickey? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a large burden of proof on companies like your own to convince people through evidence that this new information is actually helping them make better decisions. Yeah, and that's that's where that's where I think the the field needs to be focused. Um, we have, um, I think, approximately 140 publications that have, you know, helped document the the clinical impact and value of, of the test. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone in this space would benefit from having more robust clinical outcomes data um, to support the, you know, the relevance of the detections. Yeah. What is, what is the process of providing a metagenomic analysis of a patient sample? What, what does the laboratory need to go through? What types of improvements are needed and where are we making those improvements? So the, um, you know, pretty much it's a, it's a, I won't say it, it's a, <laughs> there are a limited number of steps. It's not a simple process. But yeah. basically, uh, we're talking about uh, nucleic acid extraction. Uh, often there is target enrichment. 
in order to get uh, try to enhance the microbial uh, nucleic acids that's in the sample and try to deplete uh, as much of the human nucleic acid that's there. First, it, you have to prepare the sequencing library, and then you do the actual sequencing. Uh, most often, that's, that's currently done on Illumina platforms. Then there's the bioinformatic analysis of the sequencing data, and finally, the generation of the report. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the challenges of uh, metagenomic analysis, if I recall, had, had to do with the size of the fragments to be sequenced. And sure. that, that that has made a lot of progress. How important has that been in uh, being able to actually? Well, it's been vitally important to us at Carius because we, as opposed to other approaches, the, the more site specific, if you're going after an infected, uh, a specimen from an infected site, you're going to have larger fragments of nucleic acid, or the microbes nucleic acid there, and sometimes approaching, you know, whole genome sizes. Uh, with our approach, um, we're looking for microbial cell-free DNA in the blood, and those fragments are extremely short, in the 50 to 75 base pair range for the most part. And, you know, that, and they also represent a, a minority uh, of, the, of the total cell-free DNA in plasma. So, yeah, that for us, being able to do this kind of analysis uh, with very short fragments of microbial DNA that are present in plasma is really, a, um, I, th I think, one of the leading technological leaps forward in terms of metagenomic sequencing. Yeah. You raise a couple of interesting issues there, uh, Rick. As metagenomic sequencing moves beyond the bench to the clinic, what are some of the challenges faced by the community in terms of quality and reproducibility of the data? Yes, we may have, as I may have mentioned, all of the tests that are currently used diagnostically in this space are laboratory developed tests. So there are no FDA cleared tests. In fact, many of the components and reagents that are used in metagenomic sequencing are not FDA cleared either. There's no organized proficiency testing um, for metagenomic analysis. So you've got a number of different laboratory developed tests. Uh, perhaps all with different performance characteristics. And we don't have any uh, organized way yet of doing proficiency testing across platforms and laboratories. Again, this is, there really is a lack of robust analytical and clinical validation data that has been published for most of these tests. And again, I think if most people in the space would agree that our 2019 um, Nature Microbiology paper is, well, we know it was the first published analytical and clinical validation, thorough analytical and clinical validation of a metagenomic test. And I, d I do think it sets the standard for others in this space. I, I currently serve on a CAP subcommittee that is uh, rewriting the uh, checklist items for metagenomic sequencing. Um, well, for next generation sequencing. But this time, we're going to have a special section devoted to infectious diseases that specifically addresses uh, metagenomic sequencing and, you know, address the issues that are specific to ID in this space. And hopefully this will help uh, guide others as they develop their test or as they're inspected by CAP, but I think that's a step in the right direction. And the thing that most people <laughs> know about metagenomics for infectious diseases, if they don't know anything else, they are concerned about environmental contamination and how it can be mitigated and how you can trust the results when we say, We've detected a microbe in a sample, uh, that the microbe is actually in the sample and not there as a result of environmental contamination. Right. So, yeah, environmental contamination of reagents and effective mitigation tools, I think are, are the, the contamination needs to be addressed. 
and there need to be more effective ways to mitigate those problems. We have spent a lot of time at Carius on that and feel that uh, we've reduced the chances of environmental contamination by as much as 10,000 fold. It involves a variety of proprietary uh, methods that we have in house, uh, qualification of reagents, dynamic uh, environmental contamination monitoring and filtering those, those out with each and every batch. So I think, um, I think the community in, in general needs to do a better job with it, either mitigating it or acknowledging it. Yeah, so that's, um, I think that's a huge barrier to larger adoption. Another problem is the need to qualify genomic reference sequences in the database. Right. Unless you do that, um, your test will yeah, swing between missing things to calling things that are simply not there. And that's a, um, a huge effort as well. Um, as I said, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 genomes in our database. So the effort expended in, in making sure that those are quality reference uh, sequences is substantial. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> what, Rick, what are some of the sources of contamination? Uh, reagents for the most part. Um, so when we say contamination in this space, right? We can't control the traditional, when you're talking about, let's say it's a blood culture, right? You know, about half the blood cultures are considered contaminants, positive blood cultures. So we can't control for an organism that may have been introduced during the collection of the uh, sample for our analysis. But most of it comes from, from the environment. Uh, and most of it is, is from the reagents used in the in the process hmm. amazing so you know there have been fits and starts with the adoption of pharmacogenomics in medical practice for instance the use of p450 type information for therapy selection and monitoring what lessons might be learned and applied to the metagenomic space to speed adoption in routine practice rick does that make any sense or am i sort of doing apples and oranges it does make any, uh, some sense and i think the my answer would be that why did, why did that fail? Um, it failed because of lack of robust evidence that, that it made a difference. And that's the same problem we're facing with metagenomics. We, we have a lot of evidence, the potential impact, but the kind of robust outcome-based studies are lacking. It's the lack of that robust outcomes data for not just for our tests, but for all of the people in the metagenomic space, that is, you know, is a barrier to wider adoption. Yeah. I mean, that being said, it's being used at 300 plus, our test is being used at 300 plus hospitals. We performed over 30,000 tests since 2017. Um, it does have value. It is used. Um, but yeah, it's not part of any guideline. That, that's the other thing that I think the pharmacogenomic piece had is getting those those recommendations into guidelines. And that's another thing that I think the community, um, infectious disease community needs to focus on is developing the enough evidence that it gets recognized and gets put into guidelines for diagnosis of pneumonia. We, we are in a guideline for the diagnosis of endocarditis. Is part of the Duke criteria, which is pretty important for us, yeah, to have that recognition. If, if you look across those hospitals and types of patients that they're employing this technology for, it, what is the pattern? I mean, is, is it one particular type or a small subset of patients which are being uh, focused on? Yeah, our focus, you know, because we're a small company, so our focus, we can't do everything, right? <laughs> so the focus, we're kind of laser focused now on the immunocompromised patient population, because that, those are the ones that, that suffer some of the most dire consequences of infectious diseases. Um, that's not to say that it's the only application. If you look across uh, the most common uses for our test, as best we can tell uh, from the literature, as well as you know, who's sending tests to us for analysis, yeah, it's going to be 
fever of unknown origin, pneumonia, uh, bacteremia, uh, invasive fungal diseases, difficult to diagnose pathogens, you know, the evidence generation piece to get it accepted uh, in practice guidelines. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the way to cement it, uh, to hardwire it. Uh, we can we can develop and, and promote all the publications we have uh, that that speak to the potential value of the test, but the way that we can guarantee that it becomes hardwired into medicine is to get it incorporated in the guidelines for taking care of patients with febrile neutropenia or pneumonia or endocarditis or whatever, pick whatever infectious disease syndrome you want. That makes sense. Evidence is the key. Yeah. Evidence is the key. Clinical utility. Exactly. And that's, you know, so much of the microbiology community has been focused on for years. Let's take a simple example. Let's compare two real-time PCR tests for cytomegalovirus, and one performs a little better than the other. And then you adopt one based on that analytical performance data without any evidence that that difference in analytical performance data has any clinical impact. That's a, it's a rather simple analogy, but um, that's the way and, and that's part of the problem is that the laboratory community is still focused on pathogen by pathogen. They want to know that, right? Of the 15 pathogen, 15, the 1500 potential pathogens in our clinically reportable range, they want to know what our performance characteristics are for each and every one of them. Right. And that's not possible with a metagenomic test. There's something called a methods based analysis that you do your best to figure out you know, how your test is going to perform across a whole variety of of organisms. So we picked 13 representative organisms that span viruses, parasites, fungi, and bacteria, and varied in terms of their genome size and G plus C content. And that served as the, the basis for our methods-based validation, which is something that is accepted by CAP as a legitimate way to go. And then we supplemented that with thousands of in silico um, experiments to prove how it works with the other organisms that might be in the, in the data. But no metagenomic test can provide you that um, performance metric for each and every reportable organism when you have I don't know if you have 1500 organisms, how would you do that, Mickey? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Very carefully. Yes, it, you, because there's not there aren't there aren't reference methods for most of I mean, find me a uh, uh, a reference I mean, quantitative PCR for Bacteroides fragilis. I mean, <laughs> who does that? Nobody does that. It's not yeah. It's there's the the problem that the field face is not field faces is that what do you do with a test where there's no accepted reference standard? Right. This is a big, big issue. You know, I remember back to the early days of GenPro, mm -hmm. they were developing the first TB assay using mm -hmm. nucleic acids. And they had a number of samples that were positive by the TMA assay. Negative by culture. Yep. And what does the FDA say? We call those false positives. Exactly. And so until you can prove to us that those people actually had the disease in some other way, we don't believe your results. And yeah. And and part of the way and the way that we have dealt with that as a company is we realize the limitations of the standard of care tests that are out there. Um, and we can even get back to what standard of care means in microbiology, because it's really, it's more like standards of care. Um, and yeah, we depend upon when we have those kinds of situations and all of our, not all of them, but most of our studies 
we depend upon clinical adjudication of the results, which is a perfectly acceptable way of you know validating a test where there's no accepted gold standard. There are problems with it, but we consistently find more adjudicated causes of infection than standard of care. Yeah. So, so there's a, a problem here that I think is different from many other problems like the one I just described with, for instance, TB, in that many of these pathogens are conditionally pathogenic in a, in a host. Thank you. That's the perfect word. I should have used that earlier. <laughs> I, I don't know if people typically use that, but it, it, it just seems to convey the problem to me. Yes. So what do you do about that? <laughs> yeah, you try to educate people, uh, and that's basically what we do, right? So, I mean, not educate, we do educate, but the conditional, we're, we're conditionally reporting, right? There are 30,000 mm -hmm. genomes in our database. We only report 1,500 that we think are legitimate or have legitimate pathogenic potential. So that would be considered conditional reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you may have a patient that has, in fact, a, a pathogen um, detected. Mm -hmm. You know, when I took my first microbiology class, they had us uh, swab our nose and grow them out on, on yeah. blood auger. And lo and behold, I had staph aureus. Of course uh, you did. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it wasn't making no, me exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's the clinical context, right? So yeah. you can't interpret any laboratory report in the absence of clinical context. And so it's the same, it's really the same problem as you have in conventional microbiology and you illustrated it so well, just there. Yeah, it's like, yes, yeah, Staph aureus is part of your normal floor, but it can also cause devastating disease. So when we detect Staph aureus DNA in the plasma, we don't know what the clinical significance of it is. No one would deny that it's a commensal pathogen, but if we label it that, it still doesn't mean that in that particular patient, it is the cause of whatever infection was suspected. Yeah. And that's another criticism of, of metagenomic analysis. Yeah. But I think it's unfair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Rick, are there significant challenges in the reimbursement for metagenomic testing? Well, if you consider that there's no reimbursement, is that a significant challenge? Yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> What's being done to uh, to mitigate that? Well, um, yeah, there's a. Let me start this journey by going backwards a little bit in terms of technology. So, how long have uh, these large syndromic panels, PCR panels, been available? Uh, the clinical labs. It's been a decade, probably, maybe more. Yeah, a little more. Yeah. So I've, I've, I'm still active in the Association for Molecular Pathology, and we just had a um, corporate advisory council meeting where we invite people from the industry in to talk to some of the ID experts in, at AMP to find out what the uh, challenges are for reimbursement in the ID space. And it was all about syndromic panels and the recent limited coverage determinations that have been put out by the various Medicare uh, providers with the MAX, whatever that stands for, the Medicare, I'm blanking on the name, but that's Palmetto GBA. I'm just blanking on what MAC stands for, yeah. uh, Medicare or something. Uh, but yeah, so that's still an issue. Their, their recent limited coverage determination has reduced reimbursement for many of these panels by 80% because they require now that they be ordered either by an ID physician or a hematologist. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> That's, we're a decade or more into this, and it still is a problem for reimbursement. and. You know, I've I've been part of advisory councils to these Medicare groups, and I, I just don't understand uh, the reluctance uh, to sign off on these. 
Clearly, they have benefit. Clearly, they reduce laboratory testing costs. Um, it, it's a it's kind of a bizarre situation to be in to see how slow this process moves. So now we're going to introduce a technology that is orders of magnitude more complicated and trying to convince the insurers, Medicare and the private payers, that it is some benefit to their, their patients that they are covering. And again, what does that, what do we need to do that? We need outcomes evidence, right? Yes. Okay. So that, and, and, the field is, you know, we are doing everything that we can to develop evidence around our test, but there's really a lack of that uh, in the larger community that are doing metagenomic analysis. Okay. So the other problem, even we have a PLA code, a proprietary laboratory uh, assay code. So hospitals, when they send us a test, can code it that way, but there's no reimbursement. And then, but on top of that, that almost all of the patients that we do testing on are in the hospital. So there's no fee for service. It's rolled into the DRG payment. We are doing institutional billing. So the cost of our test, they, there's no opportunity for the laboratory to recover that cost, um, which, is, which is a problem in terms of this whole financial uh, situation. Hmm. You, you know, it, it strikes me that there's a an interesting problem here with these syndromic panels, and and even bigger with yours in that it, the regulatory agencies are accustomed to thinking about one target, one test, and now de facto these are multiple tests, and they often require a lot of samples of each individual pathogen in order to derive the evidence. Yeah. And how much of that is an issue here? Yeah, the, I mean, that's going to be a particular problem with metagenomics because, yeah. because it's what we see in the studies that have been published. We don't see the full representation of the 1,500 organisms that we report, right? No one center is going to turn up detections for any more than a handful of so it requires, yeah, it's a really hard thing to get that kind of coverage across 1,500 pathogens. And that's why we're, we're focusing on specific targeted patient populations where the pathogens that you might expect to find are going to be relatively small in number. Yeah. And we just published a paper that reports our, our clinical lab results for microbial cell-free DNA sequencing over two and a half year period. It's over 15,000 patients. And basically it's the only way we could think of to show the complete breadth of detections. So 15,000 patients over two and a half years. And even with that large patient population, we only detected about half of the organisms that were in our clinically reportable range. So that gives you some idea of the, the scope of the problem. If you, if, if uh, payers and laboratorians and clinicians are going to uh, expect that we provide uh, for each pathogen individual performance data, it, it, it can't happen with the metagenomic test. And the way we validated the test does ensure that we should see equal performance across all of the different pathogens or equivalent, I won't say equal, but similar performance across all of the pathogens that we report. Mm -hmm. You know, Rick, it occurs to me there's, and you're likely working on this, an opportunity for uh, health economics uh, and impact analysis uh, for targeted patient populations, since you're covered right now or, or reimbursed or paid, if you will, under DRGs to show that length of stay is shortened by running your test and running your test, as you were indicated very early in this interview, you know, earlier in the disease course. Yeah, yeah we've got we've got pretty good evidence that we can change antimicrobial management, that we can reduce invasive procedures that we can shorten the diagnostic journey and therefore reduce all of these ancillary tests that are done 
standard of care tests are done. It's an amazing number. If you look at, at what happens in a patient's journey with, you know, in their hospital, they have leukemia and they have pneumonia. The number of, of tests that are ordered to try to figure out what the etiology of that pneumonia is, is, is staggering. And they occur sequentially. They don't all occur at the same time. So that lengthens the journey. So, you know, the value proposition for me is that, you know, it's one and done. Um, do it early. You, if you get an answer, then you're done. If you don't get an answer, and we don't really know what the negative predictive value of our test is to rule out infection, then you may have to continue down that path. But we're going to get a substantial number of those early and with far less diagnostic testing. So you've, you've touched on a lot of this, I think, already. But what do you think the, the major achievements of metagenomic analysis in human health has been to date? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, we've talked about, I think I've talked about a lot of the, the impacts on, you know, outcomes, diagnostic journeys, that sort of stuff. We've covered that. I think one of the things that, that um, I think is not overlooked, look, this is not a discovery tool per se, the tests that we're offering, but we do find things like monkeypox. Uh, when monkeypox emerged, it was in our, our clinical reportable range of organisms. We started to see detections. We reached out to providers that sent a sample, found out whether they had orthogonal confirmation. And yeah, like without changing a thing, really, maybe a little tweaking to the an analytics. But yeah, we had a test for monkeypox um, that was already in the bag, right, so to speak. Another thing that was really fabulous is we had a patient who received a genetically modified porcine heart transplant. Hmm. And um, we picked up a porcine cytomegalovirus that was in our database and actually, yeah, is, uh, you know, was the cause of uh, the patient's problems. So those kinds of things are, are, are just fabulous to me. I mean, just, just to think that this kind of just comes, you know, just comes with the test, right? With the territory. And the monkeypox thing is interesting because we don't want to be known as a specific, uh, a test for a specific pathogen, right? That's the kind of a waste of, of an expensive test. Yeah. But in the patient population, right? The HIV patient population, you know as well as I do that they're prone to a lot of other infections that somehow may mimic monkeypox. And yeah, we detect the whole spectrum, you know, pathogens in that patient as well as monkeypox. So that, you know, sort of one-off monkeypox test, okay, that's helpful. But not only do we get monkeypox, but we tell you everything else that's going on in that patient, which I think is is an amazing sort of a achievement. Um, the antimicrobial resistance. Yeah, metagenomic analysis so far has not proven particularly helpful in providing AMR data. We're about to launch... Um, a whole new series of AMR markers as part of the carious test that we feel um, quite good about. And I think it's going to be a substantial, um, have a substantial impact on the patients we serve. The emphasis on best use case scenarios clinically, that, that really has to, that has to be a focus of anybody in playing in this space. And we've touched on a few that our company or my company feels is, are important. But the other part of this is we're not only um, a diagnostic company because we're, we're sequencing, we're sequencing agnostically, but we're reporting uh, conditionally, but we are collecting all of that sequence information from all of these patients. And it's, we've already, uh, we have a rather robust biomarker discovery group so I think as a result of, of um, you know, launching uh, a test like, like this, uh, we're taking full advantage of all of the information that is generated, 
not, not reporting it all back to the clinician, but storing that information and using it um, for potential biomarker discovery. Are, are you exploring other types of biomarkers that might be complementary, such as immune status, uh, innate immune response, or yeah, anything I think, along with this? Yeah, I think that gets back to your question about increasing the interpretive interpretability of our report. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have been in discussion with a number of companies that provide that. We've considered um, perhaps developing our own. Currently, the carrier's test only does not include RNA. Uh, so we, we don't have um, right now the capacity to, to do the, the gene expression analysis and that sort of thing. That's not to say that we can't develop that. Uh, it's been in, it's, it's part of the discussion we have about, you know, we, we realize that that could provide um, a bi uh, an immune immune response test in conjunction with uh, with our uh, identification of the pathogen could help sort out some of these things where I'm not sure whether this pathogen is really responsible for the disease in this particular patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you see a particular innate immune response that suggests it's bacterial, et cetera. Or viral, yeah. And then or we viral. tell you which virus or which bacterium, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, that field has a ways to go. I mean, it, it, there have been some remarkable achievements recently, but um, I, I think, yeah, eventually, I, I think those two types of tests should be used in, in concert. Yeah. And perhaps it could be one test that provides both answers. Right. I've got one more question. Yes. One more question. What about the use of metagenomics in surveillance, wastewater, uh, environmental, et cetera? Okay. Um, yeah, surveillance. You'll have to not environmental. I mean, I, I, I presume we're not we're not playing in that space. But in surveilling patients, yeah, we we've uh, just uh, we've completed a study uh, where we where we have sampled. Uh, patients, you know, every few days, then extended that out to, to weeks between the samples to see if we could predict the occurrence of fever or an infection. And we do have, we have limited data that, yeah, we can do that. We can find, if you, if you do the test early, right, we can find the cause, the eventual cause of that fever or pneumonia or whatever earlier than the onset of symptoms. So that type of surveillance, we're very interested in. That's very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for joining us today and taking the time to speak with us. I think that uh, it's been very interesting. We've learned a lot and our listeners are going to be very interested in hearing what you have to say. I appreciate that, Mickey, and, and thanks for having me and making this uh, such an enjoyable conversation. Thanks again, Rick. It's very easy to talk to you guys. Oh, it's so easy to talk to you. We've enjoyed it very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Holteras Presents is produced by Holteras Associates, a U.S.-based bioscience consultancy that provides strategic and tactical services in the areas of diagnostics, medical devices, and life science research to clients of all sizes. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the episode are solely those of the individuals involved, and Holteras Associates is not responsible for any errors or omissions or for the results obtained from the use of this information. The information provided in this episode is for informational or educational purposes only and is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Holteras Associates would like to say thank you to this episode's guest or guests and thank you for listening to this episode of Holteras Presents. Thanks.